In this session, we will focus on data sharing and resource sharing practices and what the benefits and potential challenges are related to open science. Let's start with some historical background. In the 17th and 18th century, scientific societies were critical vehicles for the dissemination of new scientific findings. Experiments were often performed in front of the society fellows and members, with usually three to four experiments taking place each day. So all fellows of the society could see all individual experiments themselves and had access to all new information generated. The first scientific journals emerged in the 17th century, when scientific societies first began to systematically publish research results of experiments deemed important enough to make public. Over a thousand journals were then founded later in the 18th century, and the number has increased rapidly after that, as you all know. What you see here is the cover of the first issue of the journal Nature, published on the 4th of November 1869. Also, peer review is a relatively new invention, and prior to mid-20th century, it was usually not necessary to go through the peer review process before publishing. Based on the existing technology and the costs attached to printing, the page limit for each journal issue and article was basically the bottleneck of how much information could be shared with the scientific community. However, centuries before science evolved into a hyper-competitive, rapidly evolving world as we know it, there were already voices that pointed at the risks of departing from the open science principles. For example, Sir Francis Bacon already said some centuries ago, the human understanding, when it has once adopted an opinion, draws all things else to support and agree with it. That's why it is so important to have access to all information related to a scientific finding and to take the full picture into consideration. In this context, the motto of the Royal Society in the UK is very relevant and very significant. It says, nullius in verba, which is Latin for take nobody's words for it. It should express the determination of all members and fellows of the society to withstand the domination of authority and to verify all findings and statements by focusing only on the facts and data generated through experimentation. Again, a critical requirement to do this is to have access to all information related to a certain study or research outcome. So what do we mean when we talk about open science? Simply put, open science is an attempt to use modern technology and recent advancement in communication tools and methods which should enable us to firstly show and present all our experiments and studies in detail, and secondly, to share any new data sets and relevant information with the scientific community. Open science can be used as a collective term for several subcategories like open data, open source, open access, open peer review, or open methodologies. The importance of open science practices in general and the urgency in adopting such practices is also acknowledged at the government level and highlighted by the science ministers of the G7 member states during their ministerial meeting in 2017, as well as more recently in 2023. The ministers recognized that the incentives promoting the openness of the research ecosystem needs to be established and that the evaluation of research careers should better reward open science activities. Also, open science can only happen if the required infrastructures for an optimal use of research data are in place and if certain guidelines like the FAIR principles are followed. It was also highlighted that a critical element and requirement of all open science practices is transparency. As we discussed in previous sessions, transparent reporting is essential for others to reproduce published work. Ultimately, the overall goal of any open science practice is to support the generation of high quality and decision enabling data. To motivate authors to follow open science practices, 
the Center for Open Sciences, a nonprofit organization in the US with a mission to increase the openness of scientific research, has created badges for three different categories. Open data, when data underlying reported results made available to the greatest extent possible. Open materials, when research materials or computer code is made available for others to be used. And for pre-registration, when scientists pre-register their re research plan in advance of the study conduct by submitting it to a registry. These badges signal to the reader that the paper content has been made available and certify its accessibility in a persistent location. Currently, over 75 journals offer open science badges to acknowledge when underlying data, materials or pre-registrations are available to the community. To provide guidance for journals of how best to implement open science practices, the top guidelines, which is short for transparency and openness promotion, were created by journals, funders and societies in 2015. The top guidelines include eight modular standards like data citation, design transparency and so on, each with three levels of increasing stringency and transparency, from just disclose, over require, to verify. As users of the top guidelines, scientific journals can select which of the eight transparency standards they wish to implement and select a level of implementation for each. This modular approach provides flexibility for adoption depending on scientific discipline, but simultaneously establishes community standards for open science practices. You will find more information about the top guidelines in the recommended reading material list. Let's focus for a minute on data sharing and the data life cycle in more detail. The data life cycle is a continuum of data development, manipulation, management and storage stages. When we look at the data life cycle, there are several aspects which we need to consider during each stage of the data development process. so that sharing of data can be as effective and as useful as possible. We need to describe the data content, character and process in sufficient detail. We need to deposit and store the data where others can access the data set. We need to select storage formats and media so that the data are preserved in a sense that data sets can be accessed also in the following years to come. And we need to publish information about the data so that others can find it when looking for it. For data sharing in general and based on the top guidelines, three different levels of stringency or implementation can be defined as follows. Level one, the authors of a scientific publication clearly state whether data are available and importantly, where and how to access them. Level two, the authors store the data sets at a trusted repository. And for level three, once a data set is posted to a trusted repository, an independent control will reproduce the reported analysis and findings prior to the publication. Even if the value of open science and data sharing is recognized, concerns remain as to the impact of increased data exposure. Scientists may worry that their data will be taken out of context, misinterpreted or used inappropriately. They may also be concerned about maintaining the confidentiality and security of sensitive data. Business concerns may arise as well. Will data users give proper credit and acknowledgement to the scientist who generated the original data set? Will the scientist lose a competitive advantage by sharing the valuable resource? However, for most of these concerns, there are solutions in place which can minimize any risks. For example, provide detailed information and rich data documentation about data sets and its purpose, also known as metadata. Or establish so-called use constraints, which specify who may have access to the data and how they can be used. By providing metadata, the research scientist establishes the purpose, 
methods, sources, and parameters of the data. As such, data users are given the information necessary to appropriately apply, protect, and cite the data. If the metadata contains information about proprietary data processing or analysis techniques, the competitive advantage can be maintained by creating a second, more generalized metadata record for public distribution. However, long-term benefits outweigh any immediate risks and concerns that we may have. So what are the actual benefits attached to open science practices? For the community, but also for us as individual scientists. For example, for the scientific community, Open science provides an increase in trust related to the quality of data generated and to the whole research process in general. Open science provides better opportunity for scientists to build on the work of others. We obtain a less biased understanding of scientific phenomena. And we obtain higher data quality due to expanded use peer reviews and checks, as well as feedback from colleagues and scientists with access to our data sets. On an individual level, it has been shown that sharing data and information leads to scientific publications being cited more often. It increases our reputation as scientists. We obtain more robust and credible findings due to the feedback obtained by others. And it is usually easier for us to find and reuse our own data, code, and materials. So overall, it is fair to say that the benefits outweigh the risks when it comes to open science. And more and more funding organizations, journals, and hiring committees understand and recognize the value of open science and promote it. With positive impacts on science in general, but also our individual careers.